Okay. Uh, question for you all. What is your all-time favourite love song? Ooh. Or are you like, that's not what I think. I hate love <laughs> songs. Turn it off and they have a, turn the radio on whenever a love song comes on. Uh, I, I decided to ask Google what the world's <laughs> most popular love song is. And it's quite difficult to have a definitive answer. However, I did find one article which uh, did a bit of a survey on over a million playlists on Spotify on Valentine's Day to find out which were the most played songs. And I have a top five, and maybe your favourite love song is in this top five. Uh, we have a good mixture of old and new here, it's good. So number five, Can't Help Falling In Love Aww. by Elvis. People like that? Yeah. Yeah. A few like me, uh, nah, not me. Okay, very mixed. Uh, My Girl by The Temptations is number four. Yeah, it's pretty just coming into your memory now, isn't it? With these songs. Uh, we're getting very, a little bit more modern now. Number three is Just The Way You Are by Bruno Mars. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Lovely, isn't it? Uh, very lovely ones. And number two, Thinking Out Loud, Loud by Ed Sheeran. Very popular on, on Valentine's Day. And then number one. Any any ideas? Any guesses what number one is? Is there an older one? No, not in this one. No. Everything I do happens. No. I always love you, people. No, the answer is All of Me by John Legend. Aww. So that was the most popular song. Well, one of, yeah, according to these over a million playlists. So there we go. And the reason I asked that question is because the name of uh, Song Song, or Song Song, is, uh, which is one of the most more unusual books of the Bible, is quite interesting in that. The term Song of Songs, it echoes other terms in scripture, so Holy of Holies, Lord of Lords, King of Kings. And it indicates that like the greatest thing. So this book is basically setting, setting itself as the, the song of all songs, or the love song of all love songs. Now we may disagree with that, and that's fine. I mean, Song of Songs is probably not that many people's favorite book in the Bible. Uh, you know, if you're not maybe sort of the romantic type, if you're not really into poetry, that kind of thing, you're like, yeah, I, I'd rather it wasn't there. <laughs> I'd rather it wasn't there. But I think that's fine. We don't have to like it. We don't have to enjoy it. It doesn't have to be our favourite book of the Bible. However, it is in the canon of Scripture. And it's in the canon of Scripture for a reason. And therefore, it's important that we do at least take time to see what God is looking for to show us through it and that will be my aim this morning to just bring through uh, a few little things from it and uh, many people uh, many interpreters, uh, interpreters of this particular book have said that Solomon is the author however if you think about it Solomon had about 700 wives and you're thinking well with this particular love song this particular love story is like well, which of his sandwich wives are you talking about and you think what do all the other wives think about it and is it like the words you know did they lose some of the meaning given that we know that solomon uh, did have a susceptibility for not always uh dealing with love and approaching love in a way that god would want to another interpretation and this is where i stand um but i know others may differ on this is that it's written in the wisdom of Solomon. And Solomon, he was clearly anointed by God. He asked to, to be someone of wisdom, and God granted that request. And we see that throughout particularly Proverbs and, and other aspects. And therefore, this book uh, was written sort of in, in, in light of the fact that, that he was an anointed man of wisdom, and so it's in his wisdom. And so there is a huge amount of wisdom that can be drawn from it and the revelation too. Um, and I'd like to read a little bit of it, and I think it's helpful to do that. So if you turn to the top Song of Songs, chapter 2, and I'm going to read from verses 10 to 15, just to give a little bit of a flavour for what this book is about. Essentially, it's a love story between a man and a woman. It documents their courtship to their wedding, sort of the early part 
of their marriage. And they're clearly very devoted to one another. And, and the literature does border on erotica. And that's why it is a bit uncomfortable maybe to read it at times. But again, we mustn't worry about that or ignore it entirely as a result of that because there's still important truths to be gleaned from it. So chapter two, verses 10 to 15. My beloved speaks and says to me, arise my love, my beautiful one, and come away. For behold, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree ripens its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. O oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the cra crannies of the cliff, let me see your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet, and your face is lovely. Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes, that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. So yeah, very vivid imagery of love between two people. And the first thing that I'd like to focus on here is that this love story is a celebration of love, romance, and sex. And it's important to highlight that because the church is not always known for celebrating those things. And I'm speaking generically in terms of the church there. And it's got itself to blame in many respects. Because the church is sometimes known, when it comes to these issues, more for the don'ts rather than the do's. So it's like, no to homosexuality, no to sex before marriage, no to dating a non-Christian, no to this, no to that. And I'm not here to comment on the rights and wrongs of those things, or say that they are wrong in themselves. But often they have been, the, do, the don'ts and the no's have been spoken about with such frequency, judgment, that it becomes the perpetuating narrative within and outside the church. To the point where sex becomes a taboo subject. Not talked about in conversation, not always talked about from the pulpit. And that's a great shame because the Bible has such a high, rich view of love, romance and sex. You know, in the world out there, you know, it's normal, it's good, it's okay, it's great to have one night stands, to have casual sex, to jump into bed at the first opportunity. Marriage has become maybe an optional thing. Well, it's, it's not for us. Whereas you look through scripture, a husband, the relationship between a husband and wife is, uh, is, a, is a covenantal relationship before God. And this reflects Christ's relationship to the church. There is that deep commitment to two people, to the extent that they become one flesh. This is a holy, um, sacred thing, which is acknowledged in parts of society, but not always. And then we think about sex, that in, in the Bible, and this is epitomized in the Song of Solomon, the Song of Songs, you know, yes, it's for procreation, but it's also a gift to be enjoyed within the context of marriage. It's such a healthy, rich view, and therefore it's so important that the church acknowledges this and celebrates this, <coughs> because the world out there needs to know what this looks like in a healthy sense. So much pain has been caused because sex has been abused, that marriage has been dishonoured. And the church can lead the way in saying, look, God values these things. He loves these things. He values them amazingly. You know, I don't know about you, I love hearing stories of how couples come together. If I've just met them, one of the first questions is, how did you meet? And invariably, every story is different. And it's lovely. And do you know what? God is often the orchestrator of those stories. Because he loves to bring people together. He loves bringing two people together together. He's created this um, for enjoyment and for his work here on the earth. So let's be a people that celebrates this, but also that acknowledges the challenges. Marriage is difficult. Sex can be difficult, again, within the context of marriage. And we must be a church that is okay at discussing them together from the pulpit. And we can lead the way in a world that is losing sight of the high view that God has placed on these things. 
And speaking of relationships, I mean, it, there's, there's, there's a lot of great wisdom within this book. If you're beginning a relationship or you're in um, a relationship, there's things like what we just read, catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards for our vineyards are in blossom. To catch the foxes is always like, be wary of the different things that could come into your marriage and disturb it. Little foxes, what are those little things maybe in your marriage that may seem insignificant but could gradually ever away and disturb and disrupt the union that you have with your spouse? And then there's a familiar refrain uh, throughout the book. Uh, where is it? You know, do not awaken love until its proper time. It's a familiar refrain throughout the book. And it's again holding that high view of love and not awakening it preemptively. But it's true, if you look throughout the book, there's lovely little things to glean that may help your own relationships. But beyond that, there is something else that we can glean from Song of Songs. And so, just uh, if you can, turn with me to Ephesians. We're just going to have a look at another bit of scripture. Ephesians chapter 5. <coughs> and we'll be looking at verses 22 to 33. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33. So this is highlighting something that we can bring into our reading of Song of Songs. So this is what it says. Wives submit your husbands as to the Lord. The husband is the head of of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should, should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify her and cleanse her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendour, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does for the church. Because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, it let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So again, we're seeing that high value of marriage, but also how it reflects more broadly Christ's relationship to the church. And throughout our journey through the Bible, the tagline is the story of Jesus. Throughout all of it. I remember an old, um, a lecturer at my old Bible college who said that the Old Testament conceals Jesus, the New Testament reveals him. And there'll be noticeable aspects in the Old Testament where that, that's Jesus, that's Jesus. But the thing is, he is sort of hidden, concealed in all aspects of it. He is written on every page. If we have eyes to see that and the Spirit to speak to us. And this comes into play with Song of Songs. That as we look through the canon of Scripture, we're meant to read it in light of what we know of the whole of Scripture. And as this passage so it shows the relationship between a man and a woman is a reflection, a picture of Christ's relationship to the church. Revelation 21 verse 1 to 2, this is echoed even further, that I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her as her husband. And as we read through Song of Songs, it can, it can be maybe like a bit uncomfortable thinking on Christ's relationship with the, the church. I mean, this, the wording here is a little bit odd, you know, you know, a bit graphic, you know, what am I to make of that? But we mustn't let that stop us from receiving important revelation and insight into Jesus' love for the church. In the end, all metaphors, all illustrations, they're, they're imperfect. We're not necessarily meant to go to the nth degree with them. In the end, you'll just become stumble, stumble, stumble. 
but there is still a rich truth that we can be gleaned from it. And in Song of Songs, as we, we look at the deep affection, the deep love, the deep longing that this man and woman have for each other, we are given a picture of Jesus' love for the church. That Jesus deeply loves the church, is deeply affectionate for the church, deeply longs and desires <coughs> for it. And as this passage in Ephesians says, it is that love that took him to the cross for his bride. It was the ultimate act of public, a public display of affection. The cross of Jesus Christ. Lavishly poured out for us. And therefore as we reflect on this union between the man and woman in Song of Songs, where it's just, it's just a reflection of love. You just look at these two and as you read through it, what a picture that is of how God just loves us so much. And that is what it's meant to do. So read this book in light of that wonderful revelation. And so as we think about our own church, Hope Church, Parks, that Jesus lavishly loves us, that he is deeply passionate about this fellowship, deeply committed to this fellowship, deeply committed to using me and you in this community, in your workplaces, in your neighbourhood. He is deeply committed and longing to use you and pour out your love, his love through it. He loves this church. And he loves all churches. Just as he deeply loves us, he loves the evangelical churches. The Pentecostal, the Pentecostal church this women, the Anglican, the Catholic, the Brethren, the Baptist. And it's important to remember this as well because, and I'm guilty of this myself, is that if the church maybe disagrees with something that I stand for something, I can be very easy to criticise it and be in a point by a place of moral superiority. Oh, I'm, I'm, my theology's right. There's a point. <laughs> That kind of thing, and then we might hear something going wrong uh, about what's going on over there. <laughs> and and that's, I'm guilty of that. And I think it's something that can creep in. That, that, that we know that Jesus that loves our church, but do we know that Jesus deeply loves all churches of every denomination? And the church has got it wrong so often, and the church is divided, but Jesus still loves the church. Deeply. So let's be careful as we, we talk about and think about other churches. Let's check our hearts, let's check our words, that we are honouring them. Even though we may disagree with them, even if they're doing something wrong, we remember that Jesus loves them and that we pray that God will bless them. And then if we think about the wider church, I'm, I'm a, bit, a bit biased here because of my work, but persecution of Christians is increasing and they are our family. And Jesus loves them. And Jesus wants us to stand with them in prayer and in whatever way he's calling you to. Because Jesus loves the church. And we are all connected, one family. So yes, let's plug ourselves into this church and please, please do. Please love it. But let's also love our brothers and sisters, whatever their denomination whatever their background, because Jesus died for them, and Jesus deeply loves them. Mm. I mentioned earlier that, that the, the acronym PDA, Public Displays of Affection, we've all been out and about, and you can just see a couple that clearly love each other, and they are, oh, that's amazing. And they, and they, and you're like, get a room. <laughs> get a room. And I think in itself that this is a helpful picture for us because Jesus has publicly displayed his affection for us on the cross. And my encouragement and challenge to us all is that as a church, are we publicly displaying our affection to him in return? In uh, the Old Testament, there's the prophet Hosea, and God calls him to a very unique task, and that is to marry a prostitute called Gomer. 
because Gomer will be unfaithful, but the challenge for Hosea is to keep loving her. And this is a picture of God and the Israelite and the Israelites. Basically, and it's basically saying that, that God has poured out his love onto the Israelites, but they've not returned the favour at all. They've abused it, they've turned their back completely on God. And by using this imagery, we're getting inside into the heart of God. He's a jilted lover. And his heart is grieved that his people are rejecting him. And if you think about that in the context of the church, that Jesus has lavishly poured out his love. God has lavishly poured out his love through Jesus on the cross. But the church can so often just fail to return that affection. And that grieves the Lord. That grieves him because he's given so much, but also he knows that when we live in the fullness of his, of, of what he wants for us, he knows what that brings, he knows what he does that does for us, he knows what it does for our world out there. And it grieves him when we're not returning that affection and he's not able to pour out that blessing as he wants to. And so we need to ask ourselves, are we contributing to a church that is affectionately giving its all to Jesus. And what does that mean for us? I heard quite recently that um, someone was speaking and they said that there'd been a survey of church uh, staff and apparently the regular attendance to church now is when people go to church every four to six weeks. That is deemed regular attendance. Which is shocking. You know, that, that is not wholehearted devotion to Jesus. That is not wholehearted affection for Jesus. And I'm not saying we have to be here every week. And I, I know that we have lives to live. I, I get that. But is coming to church a priority for us? Are we like, well, I don't feel like to go. I would, I would, I would go. Are there things taking precedent? precedent? And that's a question we've got to ask ourselves. Because if other things are, that's half-hearted affection. And Jesus doesn't deserve that. He's given his life for us, the church. And he says, I want back your affection in return. In terms of serving the church, are we giving our all? Are we doing our bit so that the world out there knows that there is a church that lavishly loves Jesus because Jesus lavishly, lavishly loves the church? If it just sees half-hearted devotion and affection, it's that they're not gonna, the world's not going to stand up and take notice. And when we come to worship, are we worshiping in wholehearted spirit and truth? Or are we easily distracted, our mind on other things? Jesus deserves a wholehearted affection. Are we giving that? Are we playing our role? Are we returning the love that he so lavishly poured out? Where in our lives can we step it up? Where can we show more our affection for Jesus? Because the more we do that, the more the world will take notice. And they'll be like, who is this Jesus that has loved you so much that you're responding in that way? Who is this Jesus that has united you together, that despite your differences, you're united as one? Who is this Jesus? I want to find out. And it is only by giving ourselves more and more to him that the world will take notice. And the world out there needs to take notice. The world desperately needs to know the love of Jesus. And God is using his church to be that channel. Me and you. The bride of Christ. Jesus loves the church lavishly and that is what song of songs can remind us of it is a unique insight into his love for us and let's make sure that we return that affection to him amen let's pray heavenly father we thank you for this book song of songs and uh we may we just have a renewed uh appreciation for it. As we leave this place today, 
may you go with just a, a greater love for your church and a greater love uh, for you, Jesus. And uh, may it be a love that captivates the world. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're going to come to communion now. Uh, and passage to just read down in one minute. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.